all jurors are present, are both sides ready to start? Um, does people have a, a free sidebar, please? Sure. Okay, is there anything else before we start this morning? Judge, just if oh, I'm sorry, hold on just a okay. Chance, Judge, if you could get us a, a calendar for September and October, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks. I guess I haven't done that because everything's sort of moving quickly and I just, things are up in the air. If there's particular days that you all have asked to have off or you're not available and you told me about it, just assume those days are going to be off. Okay. I just, um, I just, I just was, I don't know what I was waiting for, just to sort of see how things go this week and then ask the state about where we are. Okay. I just, I wasn't sure if we're going faster than planned or as planned. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you.
Jurors are entering. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, sir. You can put your hand out and be seated. Please uh, lean into the microphone so we can hear you and state your full name and spell your last name. Michael Morrison, M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N. Good morning, Mr. Morrison. How are you? Good morning, sir. Uh, how are you employed, sir? I'm sorry? How are you employed? Are you working? Are you employed? Are you working? Yes, sir. What do you do? I am a paving crew leader for the city of Tamarack. Okay. I'd like to call your attention to February the 11th, 2017. How were you employed on that date? I owned a business, Sunrise Tactical Supply. Okay. And how long had you owned Sunrise Tactical Supply? I believe we opened in 2013. Okay. And what type of... Uh, things would you sell at, at Sunrise Tactical Supply? We were a licensed firearms dealer, ammunition, holsters. Uh, we did classes, uh, concealed weapons classes. Um, it related to the trade. Okay. And um, you started the business in 2013? Correct. Okay. Uh, when you sell a firearm, what is the procedure that, that's used? Procedure is the customer who wants to purchase needs to fill out a Form 4473. Once that's completed, a background check is then submitted. The information from that form is submitted to the state, and upon an approved control number coming back from the state, the firearm is either released the same day to a person with a concealed weapons permit, or there is a five business day wait without the concealed weapons permit, which does not include weekends and holidays. Okay. And where was Sunrise Tactical located? 7600 Wiles Road. Okay. And a, a 4473, that's a federal form? Yes, sir. Okay. And do you, were you the custodian of records of that form? Yes, sir. At Sunrise Tactical? Okay, Mr. Morrison, I want to show you now State's Exhibit Mark. Uh, 19V for identification, sir. And if you would uh, look at that and see if you recognize it. This is Mr. Cruz's 
4473. Okay. And were you present when it was filled out? Yes, I was, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer State's Exhibit 19B, and I showed it to Mr. Wheeler. Is there any objection? No, ma'am. State's Exhibit 19 B, like Victor, will be received as states 335. 335, I think. 355, excuse me, thank you. 355. Can you see this okay, Mr. Morrison? Yes, on, sir. On your screen? So, and you were present for this sale, right? Yes, sir. All right, so how was this form uh, completed? Could you run through with us how it's done? Person comes in, picks out their selection. Once the selection is made, the customer is given a 4473 to fill out. Okay. It's to have their name, their current address. Uh, then there's several questions that have to be answered. Uh, once they've completed their portion of it, it is signed stating that the information they provided is true and accurate. Okay. So in uh, State's Exhibit uh, 355, which is the 4437 form, uh, the Nicholas Jacob Cruz, that's filled out by him, right? The, the purchaser, Nicholas Jacob Cruz, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, he fills out the address in the yes, city, sir. in the county, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and place of birth, that's his writing? Yes, sir. Uh, and he fills out the height, 5'7", weight, 128 pounds, right? Correct. Male and his date of birth, right? Yes, sir. And someone who uh, is going to purchase uh, a weapon, in this case a, uh, a rifle, have to be 18 or over, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And then, uh, Mr. Morrison, there's, let me see if I, I'm so bad at this. The, these uh, questions here. Um, the wheel. The wheel. All right, that's not too bad. So, uh, uh, are you the um, actual transferee buyer of the firearm listed on the form? If you're not the actual transfer buyer, you are acquiring the firearm on behalf of another person. If you are not the actual transfer buyer, the licensee cannot transfer the firearm to you. Exception if you are picking up a repaired firearm for another person and you are not required to answer 11A and may proceed to question 11B. See instructions for question 11A. Who fills out? Yes. Yes. He, he does, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you under indictment or information in any uh, court for a felony or any other crimes for which the judge could imprison you for more than one year? See instructions for question 11B. The check mark, no, he does that. Correct. Right? Okay. Uh, have you ever been convicted of a felony, uh, convicted in any court of a felony or any other crime for which the uh, judge um, could have you imprisoned you for more than one year, even if you received a shorter sentence, including probation? See instructions for question 11C. He writes no, correct? Correct. And that's his check mark, correct? Yes, sir. Are you a fugitive from justice? See uh, instructions for question 11D. He, he writes no, correct? Correct. Okay. Are you, uh, an unlawful, are you an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any depressant stimulant, narcotic drug, or any other controlled substance? Warning. The use or possession of marijuana remains unlawful under federal law regardless of whether it has been legalized or uh, decriminalized for medicinal or recreational purposes in the state where you reside. And he Check checks no. no, correct? Yes, sir. Check more? Okay. 
Have you ever been adjudicated as a mental defective or have you ever been committed to a mental institution? See instruction for question 11F. He checks no, correct? Correct. This is check mark. Okay. Have you ever been discharged from the armed forces under uh, dishonorable conditions? His check mark, no, correct? Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. Are you subject to a court order restraining you uh, from harassing, stalking, or threatening your child or an intimate partner or a child of such partner? See instructions for question 11H. He check marks no, correct? That's his check mark? Correct, okay. sir. Have you ever been convicted in any court of a misdemeanor crime or domestic violence? See instructions for question uh, 11 uh, I. That's his check mark, right? Correct, no. no. Uh, 12, uh, country of citizenship, United States of America. That's his check mark, correct? Yes, sir. And then 12B, have you ever been renounced? Have you ever renounced your United States citizenship? His check mark, no, correct, Mr. Morrison? Correct. Okay. Are you an alien illegally or unlawfully in the United States? Check mark. His check mark. No. Correct. Correct. All right. Are you an alien who has been admitted to the United States under a non-immigrant visa? And he's checked. No. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then, if yes, you fall. Uh, within any of the exceptions stated in the instructions, and he puts a check mark under N.A., not applicable, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, that's the first page, correct? Yes, sir. Correct. Okay. And he fills that out himself? Yes. Okay. And then the second page... It's his signature right there, and the date, 2-11-2017. Can you see that? Or see the top line, number 14, transferee, buyer signature? Yeah, um, yes. Okay, and the date, the certification date, that's the date that he comes in to make the purchase? Yes, sir. So February the 11th, 2017, correct? Correct. And then it says type of firearm, long gun, who makes that check? That is made by the employee of the store, the clerk. Okay. And when you were working that day, did you have an employee working with you? Yes, sir. And what's that person's name? David Martinez. Okay. And uh, line 13, uh, identification, is that Mr. Martinez's uh, handwriting? Yes, sir. And then number or identification, what's that? That is the license, that's the number on the driver's license or ID from the state. Okay. And uh, the expiration, expiration date, 924-205, right? Correct. So you check identification, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And in that, uh, your, your form, you have this identification, right? Yes, sir. And that is... Florida identification card, right? Yes, sir. Nicholas Jacob Cruz, his address in Parkland, and that and date of birth, and that matches what he had put on the 4473 form, correct? Correct. Okay. And you demand identification, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, the third page, uh, what's this? The signature line on the third page is what needs to be needs to be signed upon the release of the firearm. Okay. And uh, the description at 24, the manufacturer importer, uh, S&W, what's that stand for? Smith & Wesson. And M&P Sport 2? Is the model of the rifle. TF-162-14? Serial number. Okay. And type rifle? Yes, sir. And then the caliber 5.56-223, 5, 5, what's that mean? Yes, sir. That's the caliber that the rifle is rated to shoot. Okay. And, of course, it has Sunrise Tactical and your address on there, correct? Yes, sir. And then you recognize Mr. Martinez's signature? Yes, sir. Okay. 
And so the transfer was 2-18 of 2017, right? Yes, sir. And that you explained to us before, the five-day has to be five-day waiting period if you don't have a concealed weapons permit. Correct, excluding weekends and holidays. Okay. And part of this form is your sales slip. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay. You see when it says paid, whose handwriting that is? That's mine. Okay. And the price of the weapon was $618.74? Correct. Okay. So before, what's the procedure for when you meet someone who comes in to the store to buy a gun? What do you do? And what did you do in this case during the sale? Do you have any procedures you follow? Every customer is engaged in conversation. We look for any red flags, any signs of why the sale should not happen. If for any reason anyone was uncomfortable with anything about the sale, the sale did not happen, period. Okay. And did you engage that conversation with Nicholas Cruz? I had a brief conversation, I believe, on pickup, as I stated in my deposition. I came out and asked him, what are you going to do with the rifle? And the reply was, I go shooting with my friends on the weekends. I just want my own stuff. Okay. All right. Let me show you now State's Exhibit 270. And it's made safe for Mr. Morrison. Do you recognize what this is? That is the M&P Sport Rifle. Okay. And do you know where the serial number is? It would be on probably the opposite side of the magazine well. Okay. Or on the receiver by the trigger right here on the bottom. Okay. TF-162-14, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the rifle you sold to Nicholas Cruz, correct? Yes, sir. All right. When you sold this gun, were there any additions made? In other words, how much? No, sir. There was nothing on the rifle when it left the store. Okay. So this weapon here has a bipod. Yes, sir. Right? Right? Correct. Is that on the weapon? No, sir. Okay. And it has, well, why don't you tell us what else it has that wasn't sold? It did not have the bipod. It did not have the vert grip. The sight may have been in the box because there was no rear sight on it. It's a standard flat top receiver, and there was no sling. Okay. All right. Mr. Morrison, thank you very much. Your Honor, I have no further questions for Mr. Morrison. Mr. Benson, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Pass up. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Morrison, good morning. Good morning. You mentioned on direct that an 18-year-old could walk into the store and purchase a firearm. Is that accurate? At that particular time, yes. Is it accurate now? No, sir. What is it now? It's 21. Irrelevant. You can answer the question, sir. 21. You have to be 21 years old to purchase a firearm. Yes, sir. Regardless if it's a small handgun or a high-velocity rifle. Correct. I'm not sure you can see what I'm looking at here. Can you see that? No, sir. Is it working? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. So who can't buy a firearm? Pardon me? Who can't buy a firearm? Convicted felon. Okay. Anyone else? A person who is using marijuana medically. 
anyone domestic violence. Uh, there's a, you know, when, when you do the background check, the information is submitted to the state. So the state determines that control number, whether it's an approval or not. All right, and you mentioned there, there was a, there's an additional, I guess, hedge the person would have to jump over. When they walk into your store, you would have this interaction with them, right? Yes, sir. All right. um, the salesperson, according to the, uh, the form here, was your employee David Martinez, is that correct? Correct. Would he be the person interacting with Mr. Cruz? We both were. We both engaged. It was busy. And we both, at some point or another, engage with customers. Okay. So it's not uncommon for two of us to engage with one customer. Well, you, you mentioned that you had this conversation with them upon pickup of, of the weapon. That's after the five-day waiting period, correct? Correct. So is it safe to assume that Mr. Martinez helped them in the initial selection of the firearm? Yes. Okay. And he would have that interaction, that initial interaction with them? Yes, sir. Okay. Judge, can I have a second? Sure. Nothing further. Thanks, Judge. Okay, is there anything else, State? Uh, no, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you, I do. Thank you. You can uh, put your hand down and be seated. And when you're seated, please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Rebecca MacDougall, M A C D O U G A L L. And, uh, Doctor, what is uh, your occupation? I'm the Chief Medical Examiner at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office. And how long have you been the Chief Medical Examiner at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office? Since June of 2021. Okay, and before that, could you describe your work history? I can. Education as well? Please. Okay, I did my undergraduate at the University of Texas. I went to medical school at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, Texas. I did a four-year anatomic and clinical pathology residency at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. And I did a one-year forensic pathology fellowship at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office. Okay, and how about your work experience? After I completed my fellowship in June of, 2020, uh, June of 2011, I'm sorry, I stayed on at Broward as an associate medical examiner. Okay. Uh, you uh, have any medical licenses? I do. Where? In Texas, New Jersey, Mississippi, and Florida. Okay. And are uh, you um, on any boards? Um, American Board of Pathology? 
So I do have my boards in anatomic and forensic pathology. Okay. All right. Um, how many autopsies in your career, doctor, would you say that you have performed? About 3,500. Okay. And of those 3,500, could you give us an approximation how many times you were able to determine the cause of death? 3,500. Okay. And of those 3,500, just again an approximation if you can, how many of those autopsies uh, were um, the cause of death was gunshot wounds? Probably a thousand. Okay. Uh, I'd like to call your, uh, have you ever uh, testified as an expert in forensic pathology? I have. How many times? Over a hundred. And in what courts? Palm Beach County and Broward County. Okay. I'd like to call your attention uh, to uh, Thursday, February the 15th, 2018. Uh, were you working on that day? I was. Okay. And were you called upon uh, to pro perform certain autopsies? I was. Okay. And did you uh, perform an autopsy on uh, a young man named Alex Schachter? I did. Okay. I'd like to show you now, ma'am, uh, state exhibits. Uh, 17C, 17S, 17R, 17Q, 17P, 17O, 17N, 17M, 17L, and uh, I'm going to this is already in So um, with those uh, exhibits, uh, Dr. McDougall, uh, do you recognize what those photographs are? I do. And, and were they taken uh, during the course of uh, your uh, autopsy of Alex Schachter on Thursday, February the 15th, 2018? They were. Okay. And would they assist you in explaining to the court and to the jury the nature of Alex Schachter's wounds? They would. And would they assist you uh, in uh, describing the manner and cause of death? Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer um, these exhibits. Is there any objection? I just need to review them quickly if I may. Sure. sure. If you don't mind.
Okay, over the defense objection, state 17L, as in Larry, will be received as 356. 17M, like Mary, will be received as 357. 17N, like Nancy, 358. 17O, 359. 17P, 360. 17Q, 361. 17R, 362. 17S, 363. And 17T, like Tom, 364. Thank you, Alan. Dr. McDougall, when the, while the clerk is uh, marking the evidence, uh, could you give us the age, height, and weight of uh, Alex Schachter, please? I can. He's 14 years old, 105 pounds, and 60 fin 65 inches in length. Okay. And State's Exhibit 200, is this Alex Schachter you performed the autopsy on? Yes. I want to show you now State's Exhibit uh, Mark 356. And, uh, can you see that okay? I can. Okay. You have one uh, wound labeled A and one B. Could you describe, let's start with A, obviously. Uh, could you describe that to us? I can. So gunshot wound A is a penetrating gunshot wound to the right side of the chest. It injures the upper lobe of the right lung and the spinal cord is transected. There's 600 milliliters of blood in the right side of the chest, and the seventh thoracic vertebrae is um, also fractured. Okay. Uh, would that wound A in, in, in and of itself be fatal? Yes. And would uh, Mr. Alex Schachter be able to move, because you said it tran transected his spine? Correct. It transects his spinal cord. Okay. At the level of the seventh thoracic vertebrae. And what does that mean? So he can't move from that level down. Okay. And uh, gunshot wound B. So gunshot wound B is also a penetrating gunshot wound. It enters the left side of the chest. It injures skin, soft tissue, and muscle. Okay. And, and then there's okay. a contusion on the upper lobe of the left lung. Okay. Would wound uh, B... Uh, be fatal in and of itself? Can be. Okay. Uh, based on the wound A and B, Dr. McDougall, uh, would those two wounds be consistent with someone standing or Alex Sch Schachter standing? Yes. And why do you say that? Because they go from front to back and downward. Okay. And I show you now State's Exhibit Mark 357. And so this is the projectile fragment that's recovered from the right side of the upper back. Okay. And that's um, as a result of which wound? A. Okay. And that's why you have the A there showing that that's the exit wound and... That's correct. Okay. Showing you now State's Exhibit Mark uh, 358. So this is a cluster of ballistic injuries on the upper left shoulder that I labeled C. Okay. And obviously not fatal, correct? Correct. Okay. And State's Exhibit 359. So I can't see the letter. So oh, D, E, and F are on the, are on the here, forearm. Here. Thank sorry. you. 
That's okay. It, so this is a cluster of ballistic injuries that I labeled E. These are on the forearm of the left um, upper extremity. Okay. And States Exhibit 360. This is another picture of the ballistic injuries to include the injury on his hand. And States Exhibit 360. Sure.
Okay, Doctor. I'm going to show you now um, State's Exhibit uh, marked 362. So these are fragments of projectiles that were collected from the left upper extremity, so from those ballistic injuries. Okay. And State's Exhibit Mark 363. This is a jacket fragment that was recovered from the left chest. Okay. And State's Exhibit 364. This is the projectile fragment that was recovered from the back. Okay. And uh, the cause of death uh, of Alex Shackler. It's multiple gunshot wounds. Show you now states exhibits 18G, 18F, 18E, 18O, or I guess it's D, 18C, 18B, 18A, and 17Z. Can I ask you, Doctor, can you identify these? Those are autopsy photographs that were taken during Alyssa Aldehaf's autopsy. Okay, and you performed the autopsy on Alyssa Aldehaf? I did. Okay, and would those uh, exhibits that I read into the record assist you in explaining to the court and to the jury uh, the nature of wounds uh, that you discovered during the autopsy of Alyssa Aldehaf? They will. And would they also help you in explaining the cause of death of Alyssa Aldehaf? They will. They will. Your Honor, I'd like to uh, offer these exhibits now. I'll show them to Mr.
Bruce. You may. Thank you. Is there any objection to the introduction of 17Z as well as 18A through G for identification regarding the autopsy of Alyssa Almeida? It's no move for new uh, object percent to ground detail in DMIL 12. Okay, thank you. Over the defense objection, states 17Z as in zebra for identification will be received as 365. 18A like alpha will be received as 366. 18B, like Bravo, will be received as 367. 18C, like Charlie, will be received as 368. 18D, like Delta, will be received as 369. 18E, will be received as 370. 18F, like Frank, 371. And 18G, like George, 372. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, McDougall, while uh, clerk is marking uh, those exhibits, could you tell us the age, height, and weight of Alyssa Alpha I can. 14 years old, 111 pounds, 62 inches. Okay. And showing you state's exhibit 199, is that Alyssa Alpha Yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, let me show you State's Exhibit 365. And there's two wounds marked A and B. Could you describe that for us? I can. These are two uh, what we call graze wounds to the top of the head, labeled A and B. Okay, and what type of damage would A and B do? The, to the scalp. Just the, how so deep? Only, the, only the skin on top of the okay. head. And how deep were those graze wounds? In? Not very deep. Okay. The skull underneath was fine. Okay. And space exhibit uh, 366. So this is an entrance gunshot wound to the left side of the chest. Okay. And what? Uh, where did that go? And so this has a has three corresponding defects on her back, 
Um, this uh, entrance gunshot wound injures the lung, the left ventricle of the heart, uh, the great vessels of the heart, and the um, left lung. Uh, and you label this uh, gunshot wound C, correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Would gunshot wound C be fatal in and of itself? Yes. Okay. <coughs> and uh, you have an, an exit, K, L, and M, is that correct? correct? That's correct. All right, showing you States Exhibit 367. Okay. And <coughs> the light, but... So these are... Wait, let me see if I can... Get that light out of the way. Okay. So K, L, and M are exit wounds. Um, K and M are what we called shored exits. That means that that part of her body was up against a hard surface when that projectile tried to en exit the body. Could you, uh, with the um, aid of the telestrator, you see the different colors on there? All right. Could, could you explain to us what what assured exit wound look? Why why you say that? You can see the color and use your hand. Okay. Lacerated when it comes out of it, what it, its target um, usually leaves just a simple laceration. When that part of the body is up against a hard object, whether it's the floor or a wall. When that projectile tries to come out of the body, it goes up against that wall and causes an abrasion. So that's what this is right here. And this kind of triangular shape right here by the wound. Okay. But, and there's uh, no shoring to L. Correct. Okay. And that's an exit wound from one projectile? So since these are high velocity uh, rounds, they often fragment when they go through the body. So I only have one entrance wound and I have three separate exits. Okay. L could very well be a little fragment of that projectile. Okay. And showing you now States Exhibit uh, 368. So these are entrance gunshot wounds F and G. F is to the lower abdomen on the left side at the pelvis, and G is to the left thigh. Okay. And uh, let's take uh, wound, uh, gunshot wound F. Uh, what damage? Uh, skin soft tissue and a lot of the vessels in the pelvis. Okay. And G? G injures skin soft tissue, muscle, and bone. Okay. And now showing you States Exhibit 369. So this is the gunshot wound that I labeled E. This is an entrance gunshot wound through the left hand. Okay. What is a defensive wound? So defensive wounds are wounds that are typically on the extremities of a person, hands or legs. Usually they'll use their extremities to shield their core, to, whether their head or their abdomen or their chest, to f try to stop some sort of injury. Okay. And Stacey's exhibit 370. So this is the gunshot wound that I labeled D. This is the exit wound that corresponds with E. Okay. And on uh, Stacy Exhibit 370, is that the entrance wound just below it? That's correct. Okay. And States Exhibit uh, 372. So this is the right shoulder and the right arm. These are gunshot wounds that were labeled H. I and J. Okay, and could you tell us the path and any damage that uh, H, I, and J caused? I can. I and J are 
So I is the entrance, J is the exit, skin, soft tissue, and muscle. H is an exit wound to a corresponding wound on the um, right upper chest. Okay. And did you label the wound on the right upper chest? I did not. Okay. But where would it be on the body? It's like right here. Okay. And H would be the exit? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and the cause of death of Alyssa al Hadeth Is multiple gunshot wounds. Okay. Dr. McDougall, did you perform a third autopsy on Thursday, uh, February the 15th, 2018? I did. Okay. And I want to show you now uh, state's exhibits 18S, 18R, 18I, 18Q. 18P, 18O, 18N, 18M, 18L, 18K, and 18J. And ask you, Dr. McDougall, if you can recognize these as you I do. Okay. <clears throat> and what are they? There are pictures taken at the autopsy of Mr. Beagle and also a photo from the scene. Okay. And uh, do those photographs truly and accurately depict uh, Scott Beagle as you perform the autopsy? They do. And would they assist you in explaining to the court and to the jury the nature of Scott Beagle's wounds? They would. And would they assist you in explaining the cause of death? Of yes, Scott sir. Beagle? And showing you states 284. Is that Scott Beagle? It is. Okay. Okay, Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer uh, those exhibits that I, um, the identification numbers, letters that I read, uh, read into. Uh,
vem. Thank you. Okay, is there any objection from the defense? Please have me just renew what's objection is presented to the uh, as well. Okay, over the defense objection, 18I will be received as 373. 18J will be received as 374. 18K, 375. 18L, as in Larry, 376. 18M, like Mary, 377. 18N, like Nancy, 378, 18O, 379, 18P, like Paul, 380, 18Q, 381, 18R, 382, and 18S, like Sam, 383. Dr. McDougall, while the clerk is marking uh, those exhibits, uh, could you give us the age, height, and weight of uh, Scott Beagle, please? I can. He's 35 years old, 160 pounds, and 68 inches in length. 5'8". Correct. Dr. McDougall, I want to show you uh, State Exhibit 374. And uh, you have uh, two uh, letters there marking two uh, injuries, D that, and E. That's correct. Okay. So D and E are entrance gunshot wounds on the left lateral torso. So that's along the left side of the middle of your torso. Okay, and um, gunshot wound D. Could you describe that to us? So D and E are clustered together because they hit a lot of the same objects and they're so close in proximity on the body. Together they um, injure the upper and lower lobes of the left lung, the pericardial sac, which is the sac that holds the heart, the heart, the major vessels that come out of the heart, uh, which are the pulmonary arteries, the aorta, and the pulmonary trunk. 
the upper, middle, and lower lobes of the right lung, fractures the second rib on the right side of the chest, and there are 500 milliliters of blood in the left side of the chest, I'm sorry, the right side of the chest, and 750 milliliters of blood okay. in the left side of the chest. Would D in and of itself been fatal? Yes. And E in and of itself been Correct. fatal? Correct, yes. Okay. All right, show you now space exhibit marked um, 375. <coughs> and you have that marked F. So this is an entrance gunshot wound to the left side of the back. Okay, and could you describe that to us? I can. This wound enter, enters and injures skin, soft tissue, and muscle. The uh, vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae at the level of the eighth and ninth thoracic vertebrae, and the spinal cord. Okay, and states exhibit mark 376. Marked A. This is gunshot wound. This is an exit wound A. So this is from D, E, or F. Um, and this is where part of the projectile exited the body. Okay. And that's the right part of the chest? That's correct. Okay. And states exhibit mark 377. So this is a, an entrance and exit gunshot wound. C is the entrance. B is the exit. And showing you now States Exhibit Mark three seventy eight. So this is a projectile fragment that I recovered from the right lung. Okay, and States Exhibit three seventy nine. This is a fragment of jacket that I recovered from the thoracic spine. Okay. And Stace Exhibit 380. This is a jacket fragment that I recovered from the right pleural cavity. So that's the cavity that holds your right lung. Okay. And Stace Exhibit 381. So these are projectile and jacket fragments that were recovered from the soft tissue of the right side of the chest. Okay. And uh, states you did it 382. So our office has a Lodox x-ray machine. It takes full body x-rays of everybody that comes into our office. So this is the full body x-ray that we took of Mr. Beagle when he came in. And what does it indicate? Uh, that he's got high velocity injuries. All right. How, how can you tell that? From the difference, from all the snowstorm, so the, the projectiles fragment, and you see all the different fragments of the projectile in the x-ray. And how, how do you differentiate that? What is, how do you know it's a fragment? Because they're, they're smaller than other projectiles. No, no. I mean, what does it indicate? I mean, what are you pointing out to us that indicates they're fragments? Do you want me to? Where's my color here? All these right here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And uh, the cause of death of Scott Beagle, doctor? Is multiple gunshot wounds. Okay. Your Honor, I have no further questions so far. Dr. McCreary. I think the question. No, ma'am. Thank you. You're excused. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to take a 15-minute recess. Please leave your notepads behind. Please do not discuss the case uh, among yourselves or with anyone else. Your Honor, can we go sidebar for a second sure. before the jury leaves?
and gentlemen, we have a slight change of plan. Sometimes witnesses go faster than expected. Sometimes they go slower than expected. We do our, our best to try to anticipate how long witnesses will take so that we can break at, at you know noon for lunch and so on and so forth. Uh, today, it just so happens that the witness testimony went faster than expected. So we do not have uh, the state's witness presentation is not scheduled to continue until 1 o'clock. So we are going to break. It's about 10.45 now. We're going to ask you to please be back at 12.45. Um, so you have a two-hour break, right? 10 to 12. 12.45. Uh, please be back in the usual place. Please do not discuss the case or begin deliberating while you're on the recess. Please remember that if anyone approaches you or tries to make conversation with you about the case, tell the person to stop and report the matter immediately. Please leave your notepads behind. And other than that, uh, I will see you all in a few hours. introduced as 373, but it was never published to the jury. Okay. The state would like to withdraw 373. Is there any objection? So there's, there's no objection to the withdrawal, but this, our position would include the other photographs from last week, that there be an instruction to the jury that some items have been moved into evidence and the state is withdrawing them from evidence. Just like we would do if we're striking testimony of a witness or, or striking other things when the jury comes back. If you can just advise them that the state is in fact doing that and that, that they should infer anything from it, that's the request from the witness. Uh, we object to that. I don't see what, if the jury didn't see it, uh, why would we have to announce uh, that we're withdrawing? If something is moved into evidence, it means it goes back to the jury room, and whether or not it's published in open court, and now they're taking a piece of evidence that has been admitted and they're withdrawing it which means that there's a piece of evidence that will no longer be subject to the review of the jury. So that's the request of the defense. Well, it, but I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. And that would just include those other items from there's last week? There's only one. Okay, I don't remember. So there's two photos total. L let me think about this. Because the, the, the issue that I have is without highlighting, they hadn't seen it. So without describing it, I don't know how... I would reference it, other than saying... This is a photograph that the defense objected to. If they're withdrawing their objection, then fine. We'll just leave it in. We're not withdrawing our objection to this photograph and whatever the photograph was from last week. Um, we tried to, we brought that objection to the attention of the state and they were in disagreement with us. They moved it into evidence and, and now it appears that they agree that that picture is prejudicial and that's why they're withdrawing it. So there is a, a photograph, several photographs that have been admitted into evidence over the objection of the defense. If the state is going to withdraw or strike that evidence, I think that there should be an instruction to the jury that two photographs, one admitted in through the testimony of the medical examiner, and I can't remember the other one, but I can figure it out at lunch. The state of Florida has withdrawn that evidence, and that they shouldn't, it, it's no longer for their consideration and that they should make no inferences from that, similar to when we strike testimony, Judge. Well, they've never heard it like testimony they would have heard. They haven't seen this photograph. Uh, and I do not, and no one in this team feels that it is prejudicial. The reason we did it, we thought it was duplicitous, and that's why we didn't do it. And we have been doing that continually. 
because, for instance, on one of the autopsy photographs, there were 84 photographs during the autopsy, and we only introduced 15. So we're just trying to be very careful and not being duplicitous or putting anything in that would, uh, you know, would be considered, you know, a, uh, you know, more uh, gruesome than should be. So that's all we're doing. If the defense is going to withdraw their objection to those photos, we're fine with it. That's by no means am I or anyone else saying they're prejudicial. Since the jury didn't see it and we thought they were duplicitous, we thought we would just do it. But that's why we're doing it, not because we think it's prejudicial. We're not withdrawing our objection, but I just rest on my other arguments, Your Honor. I have nothing further to say. Put those two exhibits aside, and I'm thinking about it over lunch. And if you all can please be back at 1245, I would appreciate it. Thank you.
Please our president in the jury room. Are we ready? Both sides ready to begin the afternoon session? Stage ready, Your Honor. Okay, defense. Mr. Sinclair, just went to the restroom. Okay, by the time we line them up, I'm sure they'll be back. If not, we'll just hold them for a second. Okay, thank you. Sure. Jurors are answering. Jurors are present. Everyone may be seated. State when you're ready. You may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Rebecca Santiago. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. If you would please speak 
into the microphone, state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Rebecca Santiago, S-A-N-T-I-A-G-O. Good afternoon, Ms. Santiago. How are you? Good afternoon. Good. So how are you employed? I work at the Broward Sheriff's Office Crime Lab in the DNA unit. Okay. And how long have you been with the Sheriff's Office? Since July 2015. And always with the DNA lab? Yes. Okay. Uh, what are your duties and what are your responsibilities at the lab? Um, I analyze items of evidence uh, for the possible presence of biological material, I perform DNA analysts, uh, generate statistics, and write reports. And how about prior to being employed by the Broward Sheriff's Office, uh, what, how were you employed? Um, from December 2013 to January 2015, I was employed at Chromosomal Labs Bodhi Technology in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, performing forensic and relationship DNA testing. And from uh, February 2015 to July 2015, I was a technologist with LabCorp. Okay. And so approximately how many samples of DNA have you examined and analyzed? At least several thousand. Okay. So uh, could you tell us something about your education? Um, I have a Bachelor's of Science uh, in Biological Sciences from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a Master's of Forensic Sciences with a concentration in Forensic Molecular Biology from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Okay, and did your studies uh, include the analysis of DNA? Yes. Okay. How about some professional uh, societies and organizations? Do you belong to any? Yes, I belong to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, and I'm uh, certified by the American Board of Criminalistics uh, in the Molecular Biology tract. Okay. What what purpose does those societies and organizations play as far as, um, you know, what you do with DNA analysis? Uh, they provide platforms for uh, members to meet and exchange uh, information. Okay. And how long have you been involved with those organizations? Uh, the American Academy of Forensic Science, I've been with them since 2015, and the American Board of Criminalistics since 2016. Have you uh, previously testified to uh, testing and analysis of DNA? Yes. Approximately how many times? Uh, approximately 15. And what courts? Um, Broward County. Okay. And the Broward County Lab, is that accredited? Yes. And how is it accredited and by whom? Uh, it's accredited accredited by ANAB, that's the ANSI National Accreditation Board, and ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. Okay. So uh, you've uh, testified as an expert in DNA analysis, correct? Yes. Okay. So tell us what DNA is. Uh, DNA is the genetic material. Um, it, it's passed to us from our parents, uh, and it gives our bodies instructions on how to function. Okay. And how is it passed on by our parents? I mean... One parent give you something, another parent give you something else? You get approximately half of your DNA from your mother and half from your father. Okay. And uh, when, you, uh, when you're doing DNA analysis, how, how do you do that? Um, what, what do you do? What's your process? Uh, well, from the beginning, we need to extract the DNA. We need to isolate it from the cellular material um, and all the proteins in the cell. Uh, then I need to quantify it to know how much DNA is in each sample. So, because the next step, the amplification reaction, it works best with a specific target amount of DNA. So next, I amplify the DNA with a process called PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction. It amplifies target regions of the DNA. And during PCR, a fluorescent tag is added to that copy. Then those copies are put through an instrument during capillary electrophoresis. That instrument detects those molecules based on size, and it reads the tag, and then it generates a profile. And the, I get profiles from the evidentiary samples, and then I can compare them to reference samples from known individuals. Okay. So why do you, I can, uh, the, the extraction process, what does that mean? So you get a swab, say, from uh, a handle of a screwdriver, okay? Okay. And somebody swabs it, right? And they're swabbing it for what? DNA, right? Potentially, yes. Okay. So somebody... Touches. Uh, let's let's use the screwdriver as an example. Somebody touches a screwdriver; they may or may not leave DNA. Correct? Possibly, yes. Okay. So somebody swabs it, right? So it's you know, a uh, crime scene investigator swabs the screwdriver hand, say, right? Okay. Gives the swab to you, right? Yes. So the first thing you do, you determine what if there's any DNA. 
first I would take a cutting of the swab, and then I would go through the extraction procedure that I just mentioned. Okay, so that's it. What's the extraction procedure mean? That it breaks open the cells, it isolates the DNA, and it separates it and cleans it up, so then I end up with a little tube of clean DNA. Okay, and it's a small amount usually, right? Yes. And that's why what you do, you amplify it, right? Correct. And so that's, the next step would be amplification, and you amplicate it because? First I would quantify it to determine how much is there, and then I would amplify it because there is such a small amount, and then as I mentioned, we'd add a tag to it so that we can detect it and visualize it. Okay, and then what happens after that? Then I develop the profiles, and then I compare the profiles from reference samples to the evidentiary samples. Okay. So how do you get, describe to, for us, how do you get a profile? What are you, what are you looking at when you get a profile? Uh, it's kind of like a chart. Um, there's different colored peaks on the chart. Those tags that get added during PCR, they each have a specific color to them. Um, and based on the amount of DNA in the sample would uh, correspond to the peak heights in the chart. Okay. And how many, uh, you're looking for how many peak heights? If your mother gives you uh, one, your father, uh, right? Correct. Okay. So from a single source profile, at each location, you would have one or two peaks. One if you got the same allele um, from each parent, or two if you got different alleles from each okay. parent. And how is the peak height determined? Um, how much DNA you have? Correct. Okay. So you can have a high peak or a low peak? Yes, it would be proportional to the amount of DNA in the okay. sample. Okay. And there's locations, correct? Yes. That describe how that works. Um, there are locations on the DNA. Um, well, how many locations are you looking at? For instance, if you have one location, you have two peak cuts, right? So say your father gives you a 17, your mother gives you a 19, right? So you have a 17 and 19 at that location if it's a single source, correct? Yes. Okay, then you go to the next location, right? Okay. And how, how many locations are there that you're looking at? Uh, approximately 24. Okay. So you go along the, the, the 24 locations looking for, for peak heights, right? Yes. If it's a single source, so let's just say you're trying to determine a paternity, right? So, got me so far? Yes. So uh, you take a DNA sample, let's say you swab the potential father's cheek, right? Okay. And then you, you have 24 locations you're looking at, right? Yes. So those 24 locations, if it's a single source, you'll have 48 peaks, right? If they're all heterozygote, if they all have two peaks at each location. Okay. What happens if it's not a her heterozygote? But then it, not then it would be peaks, called a homozygote, homozygote, and they, homozygote. Would, there would be one peak because you get the same allele from your mother and the same one from your father. So if your mom's a 14 and your dad's a 14, you have a homozygote, right? Correct. Okay. All right. And so you've done that process how many times? Thousands. Okay. So now once you get a profile, you know, uh, you're trying for 24 locations along, you know, the, the spectrum, correct? Yes. Okay. And you have it all spread out. You know, it comes out of the computer, correct? Yes. And then what do you do? Then I interpret those results, and yes. then I, I make the comparisons to the reference standards that I have, and then I perform statistics. Okay. So what is a reference sample? Oh, it would be a buccal swab or a swab of the inside of someone's cheek, and then I just process that sample the same way that I process the evidentiary samples, and I get a DNA profile. And then I can use that profile to compare to the evidentiary samples. Okay. So... With your evidentiary profile, that's like from the handle of the screwdriver, right? Right. And let's say you have, you know, uh, alleles for all 24 locations, right? Yes. So you have that, you know, it comes out. What do you how do you describe that? It's called an electrophorogram. Electrophorogram, right? So you have an electrophorogram for the, uh, the evidentiary piece, right? Yes. And let's just say it's for the handle of the screwdriver, correct? Yes. And so then you do uh, an electrophorogram, right, for the reference from the, the person that, you know, to compare it. Correct? correct. And, you know, if you get, you, know, you get 24 and you compare the two, correct? Yes. And how many times have you done that? Uh, hundreds or maybe thousands. Okay. So once you, uh, 
perform is the right to call it the molecular function, the, the analysis uh, of the DNA. Uh, statistical analysis? No, after you, that's what I was going to get to. After you've described the process that you've done, right? And you've done that many times, and has that process been validated? Yes. Okay. Uh, so once you have done that, th there's a, a second part, right? It's this statistical analysis? Correct. So tell us about that and what your training is. Uh, so I have training. Uh, I've taken college courses in statistics and population genetics. Um, I've also been trained on the use of statistical analysis in forensic DNA, and I've attended several STR mix workshops and trainings. Okay. So now you have, uh, you're going to do a, st what's, what's the statistical analysis that you do? Um, the first that I've done was uh, RMP, or the random match probability. Okay, and how does that work? Uh, it uses those allele frequencies um, in formulas, and it determines how rare a profile is. What's an allele frequency? Uh, the numbers that you were mentioning, uh, 14, 17, each of those are alleles. It corresponds to the repeat units in the section of DNA that I'm looking at. And the frequency is um, how often it's observed in a population. Okay. And um, where do you get how, how many times it's observed in the population? So there's databases that contain those allele frequencies. Um, they have sampled various populations and created databases to use for the statistical calculations. Okay, and though, are those databases uh, validated and peer-reviewed? Yes. Okay, so they're used by labs throughout the country, the databa different databases? Yes. Do you know how the databases are established? What metho met methodology they use to, to get the samples? I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay, so how do the databases, how do they get the databases? Uh, samples from various individuals in different populations are collected and... Okay, so describe for us then, once you have an accredited, validated database, what statistical analysis do you perform? Uh, the random match probability Okay. or a likelihood ratio. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, random match. How does that work? Uh, those allele frequencies that we were discussing are used in formulas, um, and then they're multiplied together to determine how rare a profile is. So, can you describe that to us a little bit better? I mean, you have allele. You, what's the, multi, the you're talking about the product rule? Correct. Would you describe the product rule to us? Uh, so the product rule states that when two, uh, if two independent, the probability of two independent events occurring together uh, is the product of their individual probabilities. Um, so at each location, the probability of receiving that from your parents is multiplied by the probability of another location. And then so you can do that throughout the entire profile to determine how rare a profile is. And how many times have you done that? Hundreds at least. Okay. Ever done one by hand? Uh, maybe one stern training. So you can do the product rule by yes. hand, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So with reference to this case, uh, when did you first get involved in it? Uh, may I refer to my notes? Pardon? May I refer to my notes? Oh, of course. Uh, sure. I began the lab work on March 7th, 2018. Okay. So I'm going to show you now, uh, Ms. Santiago, uh, State's Exhibit marked 14L, which has previously been identified uh, by another witness as a swab from um, GEC1A, which is uh, State's Exhibit. Two seven. The MMP 15. So, you recognize uh, that exhibit? Yes. Okay. How do you recognize it? Uh, it has the BSO lab number, the item number, and my initials and date. Okay. So, what did you do with that exhibit? Uh, inside, there's a swab box that contains two swabs. So, when I took uh, half of... Um, 
half of each swab head and I put it into a tube and then I ran it through the DNA extraction uh, procedure and the rest of the procedures that I mentioned. Okay. And then what? And then I compared it to the reference sample I had in the case. Okay. So let me show you now. States it uh, Mark 14X and ask you if you can identify this from Santiago. Uh, yes, it has the lab number, the item number, and my initials and date. Okay, and what is that? Uh, it's the buckle swab from Nicholas Cruz. Okay, and who, what is a buckle swab? Uh, a swab of the inside of the cheek. Okay, and uh, who took that buckle swab from Nicholas Cruz? Uh, the officer's name on the package is listed as uh, Detective Crespo. Okay, all right, and once you got that, uh, what did you do with it? I took cuttings from each swab and ran it through the DNA analysis procedure. Okay. And what was, uh, what did you, what was your determination? For item 241? Yes. When you say 241, that's your lab number, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the DNA results are consistent with Nicholas Cruz. Uh, the chances of randomly selecting an unrelated individual consistent with the evidentiary sample are rarer than one in 400 billion. So what does that mean? That the chances of randomly selecting a person that would be consistent with that profile are rarer than one in 400 billion. Okay, and did you, did you have an opportunity to get an exact number? Uh, yes. What was that? Uh, 1 in 3.42 times 10 to the 25, or 34.2 septillion. Okay. And I'm going to show you now State's Exhibit Mark 14O, which is a swab from uh, an ear protection piece that has been previously identified in court and asked you from Santiago if you can identify that. Yes, again, it has the BSO lab number, the item number, and my initials and date. Okay, and could you tell us the result of that? Uh, the DNA results from item 251 are consistent with Nicholas Cruz. The chances of randomly selecting an unrelated individual consistent with the evidentiary sample are approximately 1 in 410,000. Okay. So in order to save some time, I'm going to... Well, let me do it this way. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit, Mark. Um, 14S, swab of a magazine found in a vest. Yes, again, it has the lab number, item number, my initials and date. Okay, and the results? Uh, the, the DNA results from item 259 are consistent with Nicholas Cruz. The chances of randomly selecting an unrelated individual consistent with the evidentiary sample are rarer than one in 400 billion. Okay. And I'll show you Stakes Exhibit Mark 14T, another swab uh, from a magazine found uh, in the evidentiary vest that's been introduced in evidence. Yes, again, this has the lab number, item number, my initials and date. Okay, and the results of your analysis? Uh, the DNA results from item 260 are consistent with Nicholas Cruz. The chances of randomly selecting an unrelated individual consistent with the evidentiary sample are rarer than one in 400 billion. Okay, and I'm going to show you the state exhibit 14R. The defense will stipulate that Mr. Cruz's DNA can be found on every item used to commit this crime if that saves time.
All right, Your Honor, the other items that Ms. Santiago would testify that the defendant's DNA is another magazine from the evidence vest that's been introduced. A magazine found... I'm sorry, which item in evidence is that? The evidence is 14U. And then State's Exhibit 14W, which is a swab from a magazine from Q39B from the third floor hallway found by Detective Crespo. State's Exhibit 14V, which is a swab from a magazine found in the teacher's lounge 1240. V like Victor or B like Victor? V like Victor. A swab from another magazine that was found in the vest left on the third floor stairwell. 14R is the exhibit number. And a swab, Your Honor, it's from 14M, which is from the magazine that was found in State's Exhibit... Swab from the vest that I just mentioned that's been introduced in evidence. It was left on the third floor stairwell 14P. And another swab from the magazine that was found in the said vest left on the third floor landing, which is 14Q. And then a swab from the first floor hallway found by Detective Christian. And that's State's Exhibit 10F. Swab from another magazine found on the first floor by Detective Christian and identified by him as 10G. Another swab from the third magazine found by Detective Christian on the third floor, on the first floor of the 1200 building, 10H. Swab from the knife handle found in the backpack found by Detective Christian on the first floor of the first floor hallway of the 1200 building, and it's 10I. Then State's Exhibit 10K, which is a swab from the black ski mask that was found next to the backpack on the first floor found by Detective Christian and testified by him. And the last one, Your Honor, is 10J, which is a swab from the gray backpack introduced in evidence found by Detective Christian on the first floor hallway. And I am going to introduce these exhibits along with the exhibits that Ms. Santiago testified. Okay, so members of the jury, the lawyers are stipulating, which is a fancy way of saying agreeing, that the fact that these items were swabbed and tested for DNA, that the DNA is a match to that of Nicholas Cruz. That means that a stipulation means that that fact does not need to be proven. You should consider that fact proven by means of the stipulation. Thank you, Your Honor. And Mr. Sachs, the only items I didn't hear you mention were 14N like Nancy and 14L like Larry. I just want to make sure I did not miss those. 14Q, 14M, 14V, 14W, 14U, 14P, 14R, 14G, 14H, 10F, 10I, 
10J, 10K, and uh, the items that Ms. Santiago already testified about, which was 14T, 14L, 14S, and 14O. Floating around up here? No. Uh, you mentioned I, a 14H, which I think may have been identified previously as 14N as in Nancy, but we don't have it up here. No, we don't have it. No 14, but is there supposed to be a 14H or 14N? 10H. We have 10H. We have that. The clerk and I both heard 14H. I just want to make sure we have everything. 14H is a photo. Okay. Your Honor, I have no further questions with the same. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, just give me one second, please. Sure. L will be received as 384, 14M, like Mary, 385, 14O, 386, 14P, like Paul, 387, 14Q, 
389, 14S, like Sam, 390, 14T, like Tom, 391, 14U, 392, 14V, like Victor, 393, 14W, 394, 14X, like X-ray, 395, 10, F as in Frank, 396, 10, G, 397, 10, H, 398, 10, I, 399, 10, J, 400, and 10, K, 401. Defense, do you have any questions of this witness? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're excused. Dr. Marlon Osborne. Solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, sir. You can put your hand down and be seated. Well, please speak into the microphone, state your full name, and spell your last name for the record. Marlon Osborne, O S B O U R N E. Good afternoon, Doctor. What is your occupation? Uh, good afternoon. My occupation is I'm an associate medical examiner at the Palm Beach County Medical Examiner's Office. Yes. Okay, could you uh, briefly tell us about your educational background? <clears throat> I graduated from Rutgers College with a BA in biology. I then attended um, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and got an MD degree. After that, I attended Hahnemann, H-A-H-N-E-M-A-N-N, -N, University Hospital, Drexel College of Medicine pathology program. <clears throat> after which I did a one-year fellowship at the Miami-Dade Medical Examiner's Office in Forensic Pathology. And since following that fellowship, I worked for five years at the uh, Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office. Following those five years, I worked at the Broward County Medical Examiner's Office, and I've been at the Palm Beach County Medical Examiner's Office for three years. Okay. Are you licensed to practice medicine? Yes, I am. Where? In Florida. Okay. Uh a member of any, uh, have any board certifications? Yes, in anatomic pathology and forensic pathology. Okay. Uh, have you, uh, how many autopsies have you performed? Uh, well over 2,500. Okay. And then of those uh, 2,500 autopsies, have you been able to determine the cause of death? Yes. And of those 2,500 approximately autopsies, how many were as a result of gunshot wounds, approximately? Um, Somewhere over two, 200, I would say. Okay. And uh, have you ever testified in a court of record as a 
a forensic pathologist? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? Um, well over 120 times at this okay. point. And in what courts? Um, Philadelphia, uh, Miami, Broward, Palm Beach counties. Okay. Uh, Dr. Osborne, um, did there come an occasion on Thursday, February the 15th, 2018, you performed uh, several autopsies? Yes, I did. Okay. I'd like to show you now <coughs> uh, States Exhibits 22D, 22C, 22B, 22A, 21Z, 21Y, 21X, 21W, and 21V, like in Victor, and ask you, Dr. Osmore, would you please take a look at these exhibits and see if you can identify them, please, sir. Yes, I can. Okay. And did you perform that autopsy on that young lady? Yes, I did. And that is Helena, Helena Ramsey? Yes, it is. Would uh, these photographs help you uh, to explain the nature of the injuries to the court and to the jury? Yes. And would these uh, exhibits, these photographs, aid you in explaining to the court and to the jury the manner and cause of death of Helena Ramsey? Yes. Okay. All right, at this time, I'd like to offer these exhibits. I think you should support the receiving, right? Yes, sir. Okay, does the defense have any objection to the admission of these photographs? Just going to incorporate all uh, grounds and arguments in the NIL 12. Thank you. Okay, over the defense objection, 21B, like Victor, will be received as 402. 21W will be received as 403. 21X, like X-ray, will be received as 404. 21Y will be received as 405. 21Z, like zebra, will be received as 406. 22A, like alpha, will be received as 407. 22B, like bravo, will be received as 408. 22C, like charlie, will be received as 409. 22D, like delta, will be received as 410. Thank you, Your Honor. And, uh Dr. Osborne, as the clerk is marking those exhibits, so could you tell us uh, the age, weight, and height of Helena Ramsey? If I may refer to my... Please. Okay.
Ms. Ramsey was 17 years old, and she had a height that was 66 inches and a 136 pounds. Okay. I'm showing you State's Exhibit uh, 207 that's already been introduced in evidence. Recognize her? Yes. That's Helen Ramsey? Yes. Exhibit marked 402, and that's labeled H. Could you explain that for us, that wound? Yes, uh, this wound is on the back of the right side of her head. Um, it goes through the scalp, enters the, uh, fractures these uh, bones of the skull, enters the calvarium, which is where the brain is housed. It causes hemorrhages along and it's, uh, around the brain, lacerations um, and contusions to the brain, and exits um, the left side of the forehead. Okay, I'm showing you state's exhibit mark 403. Is that the exit wound you're talking about? Yes, it is. Okay, and uh, would that wound uh, be lethal? Yes, it would. Okay. Showing the state's exhibit mark 404. 405, I'm sorry. Could you explain what that shows? Um, this is showing um, Ms. Ramsey's left side, the left side of her face. You can see the um, previous wound described as A on the left side of the forehead. Wound D is on the lateral aspect of the left shoulder. Um, there's a wound B on the left side of the chest. And a wound C on the right side of the chest. Okay. Could you tell us about wound B? B is in boy? Yes, B, I'm sorry. Uh, wound B uh, is an irregular wound on the right side of the chest that goes through the skin and pectoralis muscles and uh, fragments of a uh, projectile were recovered from within the muscles, the pectoralis muscles. Okay. And uh, how about wound D? Wound D is an entrance wound on the lateral aspect of the left shoulder. It goes through the muscles of the uh, left arm and exits on a wound that will be shown later as E on the inside of the left upper arm. Okay, and how about uh, wound C? Wound C is an irregular uh, ballistic defect um, that has a very short wound tract and no projectiles were recovered from that wound. It only goes into the superficial layers of the pectoralis muscle, just okay. under the skin. All right, and I'm showing you now space exhibit 406. 406 shows the exit wound, E, that corresponds to D, the entrance wound previously described on her left shoulder. Okay. And could you, what is above, above the E at her armpit? Do you, you see that? Yes, this is an associated abrasion, likely associated when the... Um, Bullet exited E. It might have, it hit the skin and caused an abrasion. Okay. That's what we're, what we're seeing on the uh, inside of the armpit. Okay. And states exhibit G. I mean, states exhibit four four oh seven. 
wound G. Wound G is on the lateral aspect of the right leg. It's an entrance wound. And, and the exit is on the medial aspect of the right thigh. Okay. And showing you States Exhibit 458. And that is wound F. The exit wound for G. Okay. And uh, showing you 409. Is that a close up of that wound? Yes, it is. And why is that wound so much bigger than the entrance wound? When you have um, gunfire from a, um, a rifle, there's a larger amount of energy that's um, produced because of the uh, velocity of the speed of the bullet, and so it creates a larger um, temporary cavity, and the exit wounds are usually larger in size than the entry wounds when shot from a distance. Okay. And showing you uh, stage exhibit... like 410. Yes, those are the fragments collected from the wound labeled B on the left side of the chest. Okay. And uh, were you able to determine the cause of death of Helena Ramsey? Yes, gunshot wound of the head. Gunshot wound to the head? Yes. show you now, Doctor, uh, for identification 21S, 21R, 21Q, 21O, 21N, 21P, 21M, 21L, 21K, 21J, 21I. And ask you, Doctor, if you would examine these exhibits and uh, tell me if you recognize them. Yes. Okay. And uh, do they truly and accurately depict uh, the autopsy you performed on Gina Montaldo? Yes, on they Thursday, did. Thursday, February the 15th, 2018. Yes. Okay. And would these exhibits aid you in explaining to the court and to the jury the nature of Gina Montaldo's wounds? Yes. And would these uh, photographs, these exhibits, aid you and aid you in explaining to the court and to the jury the manner and cause of death of Gina Montalvo? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, at this time, the uh, state would offer uh, the previous exhibits read into the record. <coughs>
Over the defense objection, the exhibits will be received as follows. 21I will be received as 411, 21J, 412, 21K, 413, 21L, 414, 21M as in Mary, 415, 21N like Nancy, 416, 21O, 417, 417, 21P as in Paul, 418, 21Q, 419, 21R, 420, and 21S like Sam, 421. Uh, Dr. Osborne, while the clerk is uh, marking those exhibits, could you give us the age and the height and weight of Gina Montaldo? If I may refer. Sure, please. Ms. Montaldo was 14 years old. She was 65 inches tall and weighed 108 pounds. Okay. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 101. Is that Gina Montaldo? Yes, it is. Dr. Osborne, I'm going to show you the space exhibit now, uh, 411. And you have an A there next to a, what appears to be a wound. Could you explain that to us, please, sir? We are looking at uh, the anterior aspect of the left shoulder of Ms. Montalto. And here you can see the um, you can use one of the colors, and, and if you want to do the telestrator, you, that's it. The um, entrance gunshot wound on the left shoulder, um, it goes through uh, the area of the left shoulder. It fractures the left scapula and exits on wound F. Okay. 
and uh, what did uh, what did it go through? It went through the deltoid muscle and the scapula, which is the um, wing-shaped bone on the uh, on the back. Okay. And here states exhibit um, four twelve. And you said F was the exit. Yes, that's the corresponding exit. Okay, and that's the exit for wound A. Yes, it is. Okay. okay. Now I'm going to show you States Exhibit marked 413. And you have a B there. Yes, this is on um, the anterior aspect of the chest towards the left side. It's a large wound with uh, seared edges from the 6 o'clock to the 12 o'clock position. Uh, this wound goes through the left fifth intercostal space, fractures the left fifth rib anteriorly. It goes uh, into the pericardium um, and obliterates the, ap the apex and the, left, the anterior left wall of the left ventricle. It exits the posterior wall of the left ventricle and then uh, goes through the left fifth intercostal space posteriorly to end up in the back muscles. Okay. And when you uh, pericardium, that's the heart? That's the sac that covers the heart. Okay. And is this wound B uh, fatal in itself? Yes, it is. Okay. Now you talked about the seared edges. What do you mean? This um, purple black discoloration from the 6 o'clock position along to the 12 o'clock position. Um, it's a characteristic of the wounds, and we use those to give us an idea of how far the end of the gun was from the decedent when it was fired. Um, when we have the end of the gun intimately touching the skin or almost touching the skin, you can have a transfer of gases and uh, the heat from the end of the gun causing abrasions around the actual wound itself. Um, when a gun is fired, rifle or handgun, um, not only the bullet leaves the end of the gun, you have the gases that are expressed from the combustion causing the bullet to be propelled through the, uh, the barrel of the gun. Also, you have particles of burnt gunpowder that exit, as well as unburnt particles from inside the barrel of the gun and gunpowder. So if the burnt particles hit the skin, they can leave behind a black or grayish um, stain, which we call soot. Burning particles, if they hit the skin, can cause small abrasions around the wound itself, and that's called stipple. So the further you are away from the end of the gun, the more likely you are to see uh, some of these characteristics. So if the gun is touching the skin, it can maybe only leave just a searing and an abrasion. You go out a few inches to a couple of feet, you may see soot and or stipple. Beyond a certain point, depending upon the gun, the type of ammo, the gun, uh, the uh, <coughs> you'll see uh, different patterns, uh, but at some point you won't see anything at all. So then we call those wounds, we can't tell how far the end of the gun was from the decedent. So on this wound B, in your opinion, this is a contact wound? This would be contact or close, contact or clothing. Okay. Even though uh, somebody would be wearing clothes, you could still get the contact wound like that, right? You can get the heat transfer that would cause the abrasion okay. and searing if it's intimately close. Okay. And that's what this wound B shows, correct? Yes. Okay. Now showing you State's Exhibit Mark 414. You have a C there. <clears throat> C is a wound on the left side of the upper abdomen. It too has um, a seared abrasion collar, nearly circumferentially, which is all around the wound itself. Uh, this wound goes through um, the abdominal wall it perforates the left lobe of the liver, it perforates the stomach, it goes through her spleen and perforates her left kidney, 
and it goes through the back muscles to be just beneath the area designated as G on the left side of the back where a bullet is recovered. Okay. And I'm going to show you now States Exhibit 415. Could you explain? It's a close up of wound C. Uh, the, the searing you're talking about? Um, this and muzzle, faint muzzle abrasion um, is the area here just outside the edges of the wound. And what's that indicate to you? That the uh, end of the gun, the muzzle, was in contact through clothing uh, uh, to the skin. Okay. Another contact wound. Contact through clothing, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'll show you now. States exhibit marked 417. That is a wound labeled D on the back of the right hand here. And that goes through, fractures the bones in the um, middle of the hand and exits on the palm of the right hand, wound E. All right. You know what it, what, I know, what's a defensive wound? Um, wounds that are defensive are considered wounds are parts of the body that um, someone would use to defend themselves from any kind of incoming attack. So they could be wounds on parts of the extremities from the hands to the forearms to even the upper arm, depending upon how that um, limb could be placed in front of other parts of the body, mostly the torso where the vital organs are to protect itself from incoming assault. So if somebody put their hand up like this? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you a state's exhibit. 417. That's the exit wound E for the entrance wound D that was previously described. Okay. And Stacy did it 418, and I think you mentioned exit wound G before. Well, G is a slight contusion and dippling of the skin, which a bullet was recovered from. And that is um, the corresponding bullet for the entrance wound C on the abdomen. Okay, and F? F again is the exit wound for the entrance wound on the anterior aspect of the left shoulder, A. Okay. Uh, based on your examination, Dr. Osborne, are you able to tell uh, the order of the shots that hit uh, Gina Montalvo? No, I can't specifically say the specific order in which they, were, they occurred. Okay. Was the, um, how about hemorrhaging in the, the track of the wound? Um, all wound tracks had some degree of hemorrhage. Um, so there's no way you can tell, for instance, that uh, A and D became, came before B and C? Um, the natures of B and C, um, if wound D is considered a uh, defensive wound, that could have come before the more contact wounds on the body. There isn't any um, distinct... Uh, already to the um, entrance wound D um, and afterwards exiting on E uh, there might be some distortion of the bullet um, however the wound A looks like a typical entrance wound without any irregularity and um, wounds uh, C and B um, were close through clothing so I don't think any, the hand could have gotten in between those wounds. Okay. Uh, so D likely came before the other three wounds, but I can't tell you the order in which the other three occurred. Okay. And how about the cause of death of Gene Montalvo? Multiple gunshot wounds. Okay. I'm showing you uh, State's Exhibit Mark 419.
those are the fragments collected for the um, from the back muscles associated with gunshot wound B to the chest. Okay. And state's exhibit 420. And that was a uh, deformed um, bullet fragment that was collected from her hair. Okay. And state's exhibit uh, 421. That is the separate jacket and core jacket and core of the bullet that went through the abdomen. Okay. All right, Dr. Osborne, thank you. I have no, Your Honor, I have no further questions. Any questions? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you, sir. You. Okay. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, I have some more questions. Okay. Osborne, I'd like to now show you States Exhibit 22I, 22H, 22G, and 22F. And I ask you, Dr. Osborne, if you good enough to again, look at these exhibits. They're the photographs from the autopsy of Miss Jamie Gutenberg. Did you perform the autopsy on Jamie Gutenberg? Yes, I did. Okay. And would those photographs uh, assist you in explaining to the court uh, and to the jury uh, the nature of uh, Jamie Gutenberg's wounds? Yes, they would. And would those photographs uh, aid you in explaining to the court and to the jury the manner and cause of death of Jamie Gutenberg? Yes. Is there any objection? He's going to object on all grounds outlined in D and I'll Okay, over the defense objection, states exhibit 22F, like Frank would be received as 422, 22G will be received as 423, 22H will be received as 424, and 22I will be re received as 425. Uh, Dr. Osborne, while the uh, clerk is uh, marking those exhibits, uh, could you tell us uh, the age, height, and weight of uh, Jamie Gutenberg, please? She was 14 years old, weighed uh, 104 pounds, and was 64 inches tall. And showing the state's exhibit 114. Do you recognize her? Yes, that is Miss Gutenberg. Okay, 
semiconductor. I'm going to show you now stage exhibit 422. And you have that wound labeled A? Yes, this is the entrance wound on the left side of the uh, back of the left shoulder. And could you tell us about the wound track? Uh, this wound track goes through the back muscles, fractures the first and second, um, left first and second ribs posteriorly, enters the left chest cavity, perforates the upper lobe of the left lung, um, perforates the body of the uh, seventh cervical vertebrae, and exits the base of the right side of the neck at wound B. Okay. And showing you states exhibit 423. So this is the base of the right side of the neck. This is wound B here with associated abrasions uh, along the clavicular area. And B is the exit wound of A, correct? Correct. And uh, what damage did the photo is not showing? Pardon? The, the photo is not showing. Oh no, is it, what, it went off for a second. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't know if you did that on purpose. No, I didn't do anything. Okay. No. Um, Was it off? Oh, it, it went off for a second. Yes. Okay. Uh, good, do it again, uh, please, Doctor. Okay. B is the uh, exit wound for A. Yes, it is. Okay. And could you describe, you know, the damage that that. Wound, uh, that bullet caused? Um, it fractured the left uh, first and second ribs, disrupting the normal um, spatial uh, atmosphere of the left chest cavity, making it uh, difficult to breathe. It also injured the upper lobe of the left lung, causing uh, compromise of the ability to um, do gas exchange and use that portion of the lung. Additionally, um, there was 300 milliliters of blood that collected, was, was present at autopsy. Uh, in the left chest cavity that could likely compromise the expansion of the left lung that led to death. Okay, and what was the, the cause of death of Jamie Guttenberg? Gunshot wound of neck and torso. Okay, and why? Um, as I explained, um, her ability to use her left lung was severely compromised by the entry of the gunshot wound of the path it took crossing through the um, left chest cavity as well as uh, the injury to the spinal cord as it um, fractured the uh, seventh cervical vertebrae, um, severing the spinal cord at that, that level. Um, that would effectively um, lead her to not be able to use uh, any bodily function or have a purposeful movement lower than that level. Um, and additionally, that would also affect her respirations. All right, thank you, Dr. Arthur. Your Honor, uh, now I have no further questions with Dr. Arthur. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I guess this is going to be another early day for you. Um, we're going to recess until tomorrow. Please do not discuss the case among yourselves. Please do not discuss the case with anyone at all at home, here, in the courthouse, or on your way to your cars. Uh, if anyone tries to discuss the case with you, please tell them that you are on the jury. Please leave the person at once, and please report, report the matter immediately. Uh, other than that, please leave your notepads on your chairs, and uh, have a, a nice afternoon, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you for your patience.
Dr. Lynch, you're ready, you're excused, and uh, we're going to be in recess until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We'll, we'll start back up with uh, the state's presentation.